what we're looking at here again in in mind war is not so much dealing with propaganda because that's pretty transitory and that isn't what we're trying to do rather we're trying to as i said get at the electrochemical bases of human attitudes that dispose you in a certain way take the example for of um like brain waves okay people are generally familiar with the four basic kinds of brain waves you have alpha you have beta you have theta and you have delta and the the differences of these waves of course take place at um different dispositions in your head so alpha waves are where your head is at when you are in a relaxed positive and friendly state of mind a good example for example is when you are watching tv <laughs> Yes. Uh, or if you're just relaxed and in a pleasant mood beta are the waves that your brain is in when you are actively and aggressively thinking or working on a problem that's when you are most mentally active but it's also when you're the most nervous and the most brittle so when we're trying to calm people down you know we don't want them in a beta state we want them in an alpha state theta is a kind of an interesting one because when i was doing extensive research into work in the soviet union that had to do with their research in brain waves the soviets discovered that theta had a very strong correlation with esp phenomena so it's a little of a of a strange area there and it has to do with um high emotional states and also with some somewhat metaphysical things like uh ESP and PK and so on and that's a whole another discussion in itself the final one delta has to do with extreme relaxation and deep sleep now the importance of these things again from a mind war you know I was talking about these things as one of the psychons that we use in mind war all of these frequencies take place at the subaudio level meaning that when these uh frequencies are being projected or broadcast you could be in a room full of alpha for example and you wouldn't hear a thing or you could be in a room full of beta and not hear a thing these things are all below your auditory level but and this is the important point the human brain resonates with these brain waves if they reach it externally which they can not just through your ears but through your skin through your skull uh any any medium really so if you have a bunch of grouchy people to simplify this and put them together in a room and you want them to start cooperating and agreeing on something first thing you do is switch on a an electromagnetic generator and dial it to alpha and blanket the room with alpha and without any of them really being aware of what's happened they'll start relaxing and turning into a more positive frame of mind That's just one of the uh examples. We could go into that with with for example the area of color. Now, we tend to think of color as um something that we well you like this color. You like red or you like blue or green and that's my favorite color. And we also think of it socially that different nations for example in the west we think of black as being sort of a, a funerary kind of color. And white in uh, China would be a funerary kind of color there and so on. Well, How many colors do you think you actually see? You only see 3 of them. <laughs> Human beings are what are called trichromats. We have sensors in our eyes for red, blue and green. And everything else that you think uh that you see is actually your brain combining different sensations of red, blue and green to come up with all these other subtle colors that you think you know all that you see all the time. And as as a matter of fact there is a, a, a sort of a funny story here because in 1954 there was a film adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds made and the Martians in that movie had large eyes which were red, green and blue. That happens to be something that looked good on a monster but it also happens to be the way your own eyes function. And if you were to disassemble your television set today or in the days when they still operated with projector guns in back you would find three projectors back there red green and blue that's for that same reason 
the research that we have done in PSYOP into these colors have led us to the very interesting discovery that the colors by themselves will trigger a different reaction in a human being, which means that if you are exposed to red uh, radiation, and again, we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum here, so it's not just that you're looking at something red and that you have a visual response to it. We're talking about the actual radiation the wavelengths of this color from the EMS itself that are coming into your brain. The red wavelengths incline you towards anger, and again, it's not its not because red is bloody or, or anything like this. It just had a, red makes you angry, blue makes you intelligent Calm, right? and thoughtful, and green is relaxation. So once again, if you have a room full of people and you've already blanking, you're already blanketing it with alpha radiation, you also want to dial up the blue. <laughs> so what you see here is that as you're, as you're turning these electromagnetic and electrochemical psychons and bringing them into play, and there are about 12 or 13 of them that I go into in the book, what you're doing is to address the mental state of mind of everybody who's subjected to these. And what you're trying to do is to get them to stop being angry and stop being combative and become as intelligent as they can and as cooperative as they can. And what's also funny about this, you're not just doing this to what you thought were the bad guys. You're doing it to your people, too. Most of these things are very omnidirectional, and most of them cannot be stopped because this kind of electromagnetic radiation is very, very penetrating. We are, big, we are literally at the point now where scientific investigation is breaking these things down into um, actual parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and seeing what happens when you dose a human being, so to speak, so to speak with these areas of electromagnet, uh, electromagnetic influence. Magnetism is another one of those interesting ones. Magnetic frequency, or fMRI, is now a very interesting area of research. They've been doing it at Yale and some other universities out here, and probably several over in uh, uh, Britain as well. And Stanford, too, you said, sure. right? And magnetism, which you normally don't think that you're subject to magnetism. You know, you're not, your body isn't built of iron or steel or anything, and you don't stick to anything when you <laughs> touch a magnet. But you actually have uh, a sensitivity to certain kinds of magnetism. You do have some magnetic uh, materials in your body that are very fine and very delicate. These are, uh, uh, you might say, a sort of a human counterpart to what some birds have when they're using magnetic fields to navigate and so on. Bear in mind, of course, that we're talking again of the, about the human body as an electromagnetic machine. And uh, if you look at a, an electrical wave in, in, uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, it's, you might say that it's going up and down. And what's going right and left is the magnetic wave. So for every electrical wave, there's a magnetic counterpart. And this all, uh, to not to go too far afield here, but these are the sorts of things that were getting Albert Einstein fascinated when he was trying to come up with his unified field theory when he was trying to take all of electromagnetism and figure out that this was sort of the machinery of the entire universe and that somewhere in here you could find things like gravity. But in any case, uh, when you look at magnetism, you're looking at, uh, again, a form of radiation that is different from electrical radiation, but it's still a wave phenomenon that way. And we, of course, are surrounded by it all the time, we live in a sea of this stuff, you know. Uh, we have it every everywhere we go today. We're in a very electronic society. And magnetic waves and magnetic fields, of course, are much um, more pervasive and much harder to stop in some ways than just simple electrical uh, broadcasts. So we, of course, are sitting on a big magnet here called the Earth, you know, which has a huge magnetic field to it. There are solar magnetic flares and so on that go on 
And there's an entire interesting field of research that takes all of this discussion about climate control and relates it to uh, switching magnetic fields that are in a common constant state of flux. But bringing this down again to mind war, uh, in about 2010, uh, as I discovered, um, MIT neuroscientists discovered that application of magnetic fields to the right temporal lobe of the brain by means of non-invasive uh, technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, can temporarily disrupt an individual's ability to make judgments based on previously learned morality. This is really quite something because we tend to make judgments, and again, this is that pattern thinking thing. We have a moral overlay on whether we think something is good or bad from what we've learned. This is the moral um, decision-making process by which we judge goodness or badness in things. So you can see how important this is. Entire religions are built on the ability to proclaim what is good and bad. So if you can take an electromagnet and stick it next to somebody's head and switch it on, and suddenly you sort of poof this out of his decision-making process, you're going to have a human being who is faced with making decisions without there being any moral qualities of them, whatever. Now, this would be very good if you're dealing with very antagonistic moralities, like, for example, you see now with, ex with uh, the extremism in things like Islam, where you don't want these intense moralities to govern people's decision-making. But you can also see how dangerous something like this, because... Morality is also the basis for our kind of underlying humanitarianism towards one another. Uh, we may have all kinds of, of hard and fast re reasons to want to exploit other human beings or do things with them or to them, but it's our morality that sort of holds this in check and says, well, you can or can't do this because it's not nice and it's not human and it's not compassionate and it's not moral. So what we have got here is a very double-edged kind of sword in this new magnetic technology. Um, this field, generally, if you want to look for it, if your listeners want to look for it, look up functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, because this is the area in which you can not only, as I said, influence human morality, but believe it or not, and this is sort of really at the, at the extreme edge of science these days, through fMRI, you can actually develop pictures so precise of a human brain's processing that you can create visual images of what that person is seeing or imagining. This is mind reading, guys. This is the kind of thing that used to only be there in science fiction stories and people, you know, telling stories about um, what you were referring to earlier, you know, about remote distance viewing and so on. This is not operating over distances, but we have never before come to the point where we can actually touch somebody's head with, sens with sensors and read the person's thoughts and see what they are seeing. That's what fMRI is taking us to. And again, it's a very fascinating field, um, but also, as you can probably imagine, a very, a very precarious, a very dangerous one, because once you start to be able to read somebody's thoughts, then you're really invading their personal privacy and what they try to conceal. Imagine if you're a, an intelligence interrogator and you were to use an advanced fMRI device on somebody that you're interrogating. It doesn't matter whether they're trying to lie to you or not. You can go right into their head and see what they're thinking, so to speak.